Well, welcome all of you. Uh, some of you are here currently as students, and we've worked together very, very recently. And some of you I haven't seen in many years, uh, and it's very good to see you again. And some, uh, you're not acquainted with my work directly, you're interested in the school for one reason or another, and, uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to see you here and delighted to introduce you to some of the work that I've been doing and my colleagues and I have been doing here over the last, uh, well, many years. For me, uh, it's been since 1983, 30, 31 years. When I came here uh, 30, well, almost 31 years ago in uh, July of 1983, um, I had just finished the mid-career program. I was a mid-career student. And, uh, and I did that mid-career year uh, just, just after finishing all of my medical training. I started training in medicine, uh, beginning in surgery. And then uh, after my first year, year of surgical training, I, I took a moonlighting job uh, for a year before I was about to start my neurosurgical residency. I was going to learn to be a brain surgeon. And, uh, um, and because of the timing of my application, I needed to take a year off. So during that year off, I supported myself moonlighting as a doctor. You, I was licensed by then, and I could just practice you know, uh, general medicine. And, I, and I, while I was doing that, I went back to New York City to study the cello, study music at Juilliard. And, uh, and to support that habit, I took these moonlighting jobs. Well, these moonlighting jobs turned out to change my life. The first was a job in uh, Rikers Island Prison, where I was the doctor all night long, once a week, from 4 in the afternoon until 8 in the morning, examining uh, prisoners. They would come in from the local jails by the busload all night. And the patterns of social illness were so striking that uh, I began to think about how to be a doctor at the aggregate or systemic level rather than one-on-one. -on -one. And that was, that was a big break because that's when I decided not to pursue neurosurgery and to start exploring other options. My second job after, uh, after working in the prison for a while was uh, in a, a fancy medical clinic in Manhattan examining corporate executives. They were also entitled to a medical exam. <laughs> but not by law. They were entitled to a medical exam as part of their fringe benefit package. And they'd come and spend a half a day in this uh, place called the Life Extension Institute. It was on the 37th floor in Rockefeller Center. And they'd spend a half a day, and they'd go to all of the various stations of the cross. You know, the people who'd take your blood and the people who'd strap you down and give you a cardiogram and x-ray technicians. And then they'd finally come and see the doctor. There were about seven of us. Everybody else was retired. I was the only young guy. And uh, they would fill out a, a checklist for all of potential symptoms, you know, and we'd review their checklist quickly and then we were supposed to just perform a seven or eight minute physical exam and, and do that six hours a day. And I got really interested in the, in, in the more than half of these uh, people, mainly men, occasionally women. This was 1979. Uh, um, were stressed out in one way or another. Uh, something wasn't going quite right in the way they were balancing. The, the challenges and strains and vicissitudes of those jobs as presidents and senior vice presidents of major, major organizations, most of them private, most of them companies. I found that even though I was a young person, uh, because I had the white jacket on, the white coat, and even though I had a beard and was young, I was safe. And they would talk. And, and interestingly, we would talk. I would talk with many of these people. I would talk for an hour, hour and a half, instead of doing a quick exam, just asking them, trying to understand, you know, what were these strains? Why were they smoking too much, drinking too much, having this difficulty or that in their lives? And how did it interface their private life with their professional world? 
and the challenges and responsibilities that they were bearing, I found that in a strange sort of way, the men in the prison had a kind of pathology, a difficulty in taking responsibility, given the forces acting on them from their upbringing and the current temptations surrounding them. They had trouble taking responsibility. The executives had trouble taking too much responsibility. They took so much on their own shoulders that it, 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 it was over, overbearing for many of them. I remember one guy who came in, uh, and on his checklist he said he had had difficulty hearing, which is an unusual symptom. You know, most, most people at 45 years old, 50 years old, don't, don't have difficulty hearing. So I said to him, well, how did you discover that you're having difficulty hearing? You know, are you having difficulty when you go to the movies? Or are you having difficulty in meetings at work? And, and he said, no, all of that's fine. But whenever I go home, my wife tells me I'm, I'm having difficulty hearing. <laughs> so I said, OK, well, tell me what it's like when you, you know. He said, well, you know, where do you live? Well, I live up in Westchester County, and I have about an hour commute into the city. And uh, so I get up before dawn, and I get home around 8 o'clock. And yeah, it's true. You know, when I get home, I'm really tired. I've been listening to people all day long, and I'm kind of tired of listening anymore. And yet she's been home all day, kind of waiting to have, accumulating all these stories, wanting to tell me about her day, and I just don't have it in me. So. You know, so then we ended up talking not about hearing and hearing aids, you know, and I didn't send him for a CAT scan. You know, we just talked a little bit about his life. I don't know if I was helpful at all, because, you know, what did I know? I was 28 years old, but I learned a lot. And it also changed my career, because I began to think about the challenges of leadership in organizational life. And because I, of the prison experience, I was more interested in the challenges of leadership in, in the public sphere than I was interested in the challenges of leadership in the business sector. And so I decided I would leave medicine, but I needed to train myself. And at the time, there were no places to get trained in thinking about the study of leadership. Uh, there were no graduate schools with any PhD programs in that area. Uh, there just was no place really to go, so I had to design my own training program. And I thought, well, why don't I finish medicine and at least feel like I'm a legitimate doctor, and at the same time do it in a way that might give me some tools and begin to prepare me on this path. So I did a residency in psychiatry, and I focused on systems family systems, group, small group systems, hoping that I'd be able to extrapolate a little bit from systems theory at the in psychological systems theory at the small group and family level to large organizational or political systems. And then at the end of that residency, I came here and did my mid-career year. So that's sort of how I got here. There was a parallel process to my development I'm telling you all this because it was very hard to persuade the school in 1983 that leadership might be taught. Nobody believed it could be taught. People still generally don't believe it could be, can be taught. People generally believe leaders are born and not made. And so, uh, so I'll tell you just one other strand in my own development that prepared me for taking the risk of designing courses in leadership here. And that was that during that year um, that I was working in the prison, I started with a friend of mine a musical seminar to turn people on to music. I was playing a lot of music. I grew up playing the cello. My brothers played the violin and piano. We grew up playing trios. And I knew a lot of people who thought they couldn't make music, that they were tone deaf, that they weren't creative. But this friend of mine and I, we had had a, a lot of fun turning people on to music and realizing they could actually make music. And the tone deafness wasn't physiological. Tone deafness was anxiety. 
produced by a child being embarrassed. And once they're embarrassed, every time they start singing, they don't listen to themselves because they're panicking. And because they're not hearing their own voice, they can't control their voice. So then actually they do sound as if they were tone deaf because the feedback loop by which one controls the voice is, is in a way severed by the anxiety. So we had a lot of fun turning people on to music. And at first this was just a joy, you know, and we, it started off as an evening workshop and it expanded into a full day and then, and then two full days of, of getting people engaged in thinking about their own creativity. And over the years of doing this thing as sort of an informal activity, once a month we, you know, organize uh, in a living room a dozen people and we, and we do these various kinds of musical exercises. After a few years, some business people happened to just come through the seminar by chance and they said a few months after going through it, you know, we're, we're much better at managing inspiration and creativity than we used to be. So why don't you turn this musical seminar into a business seminar on leadership? So we began working on a design for that, which happened to coincide with the year that I started my Kennedy School mid-career year. And I began to think about, well, you know, how would you teach leadership? And, how, and could it be taught? And what can you teach? Because in this musical workshop, I had already experienced during that four or five years being able to teach the unteachable. I mean, to, tell, to, to take somebody who, has, who loves music but does not imagine that they can create anything, let alone uh, a wonderful melody, uh, and, 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 and have them discover that they can, it was a really meaningful experience for me, an inspiring experience for me. And, and also gave me uh, a sense that if you hold people properly through an experience and you give them opportunities to learn from their own experience, that they can learn things that ordinarily you wouldn't think to be teachable. And it's with those two you know, uh, parallel lines of development, medicine, psychiatry, and, and, and teaching music and creativity that I at the end of that mid-career year, pitched to the Kennedy School that they hire me to develop a curriculum in leadership. And the school was quite entrepreneurial at the time. I don't think I could get hired today. <laughs> it's, uh, it's more academically anxious than it used to be. But at the time, it was quite, quite willing to run these kinds of experiments. So they gave me a one-year sort of probationary year, you know, an experimental year. And I, I thought that made complete sense because I said to the dean at the time, Graham Allison, you know, you don't know that leadership can be taught. I don't know if leadership can be taught. It's just an experiment. Let's run the experiment as best as we can. Just give me a one-year full-time job. And that's, that's what he did. So, and, uh, so what I'd like to share with you are some of the lessons from my 30 years now of doing these courses in leadership that have uh, informed a lot of interesting people like Felipe Calderon, who you just heard, or Joe Curtitone, the mayor of Somerville. A lot of his transformation of his town, he will describe, comes not so much from the financial operation, but from the courses he took here and then the consulting he's done in, in, in creating a model of leadership practice throughout his own city government. And former students, inhabit all sorts of interesting jobs uh, um, all over the world in all sectors and trying to do good works. I can't completely answer the question, even after 30 years, can leadership be taught? But I can at least define some of the key stumbling blocks in thinking about that question. Obviously, the first is that you've got to say, what do you mean by leadership that you are then positing to teach? There is certainly a lot that is pretty set in any person. I know that from studying psychiatry. There's a lot that is fairly set in a person 
in their style and their personality and their way of thinking, in their way of problem solving, by the time they're 15 or 18 years old. Even by the time a child is six years old, there's an awful lot that's already set. It's not that it's all set from the moment they're born. I don't even think people who say leaders are born and not made think it's all genetic. But certainly, there's an awful lot between one's genetic inheritance and one's upbringing in the early years of a life, as Felipe described, this is Felipe's wife, Margarita, um, as Felipe described, President Calder described, it was formative for him. You know, had he been born into a different family without a father who was doing politics every day, and where he learned, you know, sort of the retail side of politics, knocking on doors, shaking hands, it's, it's, he, he might have become a academic economist. I mean, there are a lot of career directions he might have taken, nurtured in a different petri dish, in a different setting. I know from uh, studying music uh, with great master musicians at Juilliard and then in Los Angeles with uh, Gregor Piatigorsky, with whom I studied the cello, I know that in music, the inputs matter, and the training both and also matters. You can take somebody with great talent, and if you don't give them great training, they're not going to become a great musician. If you take a person with mediocre inputs, or an average talent, and you give them great training, they'll become a really, really fine violinist or pianist. And most of you won't be able to tell the difference. You won't be able to tell the difference between a, a member of the first violin section in the Boston Symphony and, or the head cellist, the first cellist in the Boston Symphony, and Yo-Yo Ma. If you were blindfolded, you probably couldn't tell the difference unless you had a trained ear. That's how good they are. But they're not Yo-Yo Ma. Because Yo-Yo Ma and other great musicians had both great talent, and he came out of a particular petri dish. His father ran a youth symphony. He grew up in music. And he had great training. He studied at Juilliard part-time while he was also a Harvard undergraduate. And if you take a person with great talent and you give them mediocre training, they will be crippled. They will never be what they might have been. So the balance between taking people with great talent or good talent and maximizing their capacity so that they can do something that is an artful piece of work. Leadership is is an artful piece of work. It's not only an analytical piece of work. There's a lot of an analytical work that goes in it. But there's also a lot of artistry that goes in it. And the capacity for those practices of leadership really do require both fine inputs, but also fine training. I know from having listened to thousands of people now in my teaching work at the school, but also in my consulting work around the world, I know that even people who are first-rate talents and who have an excellent track record also fail a significant part of the time. Leadership's not an enterprise where you, where you succeed most of the time. People fail all the time in the practice of leadership. It's, it's like being a professional athlete. Uh, in, in soccer or football, as it's called in most of the world. A first-rate athlete does not kick the ball into the goal most of the time. And even though he misses, he's not considered a failure. If he gets it into the goal some percentage of time, I'm, I'm not very knowledgeable about soccer, I know more about American baseball. If you get on base one out of three times, that's really good. I mean, that's really good. So leadership is a high-risk enterprise. And most people fail a significant amount of time. So in a sense, that already tells us empirically that leadership is not simply born. Because if you take somebody with enormous 
capacity, who succeeds some days and fails on the other. There are clearly other variables at stake than their native capacity. I mean, why was one of the great human beings in American history, Herbert Hoover, who led the movement to provide emergency sustenance to Europeans during World War I, and must have saved through his emergency relief uh, organizational efforts more than 100,000 people. But when he became president, and the stock market, you know, or during those years leading to the stock market collapse, and, the, and he, he didn't know what he was, he wasn't a great president, he didn't quite know how to do that job. Does that mean he wasn't a leader? Well, he provided extraordinary leadership in some contexts, and not effective leadership in another context. So the first key insight about leadership is that it isn't fair to draw a bottom line on anybody's career. And I never engage in, the, I never engage in, a, in a debate with people about, was so-and-so a leader? I always disaggregate and ask, in what context? Facing what problem? Facing what kind of situation? You know, if, 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 if you had closed the book on Steve Jobs after his first resignation, you'd say, well, he was great at the startup phase. But like most entrepreneurs, he couldn't take it into the next phase, which is true of most entrepreneurs. But then he, you know, he figured it out doing other business startups and then came back. Most people only succeed sometimes. So there would be a lot to teach somebody who was successful in some contexts in knowing how to apply, how to interrogate their experience, how to capture the right lessons from their successes and failures, so that they could begin to apply those lessons in the next context, in a changed context. And that turns out to be non-trivial. That turns out to be really hard and very important to give people a kind of contextual, analytical intelligence so that they can read different situations differently, so that they can interrogate and learn from their own experience but apply it differently in different contexts. And for that, there's a lot people can be taught. There's a lot that people can be taught that's analytical, that helps people diagnose and read a situation, that helps people think strategically and analytically about taking action in a situation. Okay, so what does it mean, then, this term leadership? I think if leadership can be taught, we've got to mean something more than simply having the right constellation of personal characteristics. And I don't define leadership in this, as a set of personal characteristics. I never start with the characteristics. I always start with the work to be done. What's the problem that a community is facing? What's the challenge that an organization, be it a public organization, a community, a nonprofit organization, a business organization, what's the challenge that they're facing now, in this phase of time, on these issues? And then from that, I begin to ask, what's needed? What kind of leadership would be needed to mobilize progress on that work? And then only third can you begin to answer the question, what kinds of particular characteristics, skills, habits, values, uh, default settings would you want to change in a particular person to be prepared for leadership to meet that situation? Frequently in leader leadership studies, and I'll show you a slide of what I just described, People instead start here. They start with character. They start with character and they say, we've got to train character. Well, character for what? I mean, it depends on the context. If you, try, if you train somebody to have an assertive character, that is going to work in some cultures. You put them in another culture, and they're going to be a bull in a china shop. They'll, they'll self-destruct really fast. 
But if you say that what people need in character is, is to have a gentle spirit, well, that'll work beautifully in some cultural contexts, but that'll fail miserably in another. So you don't really know what people are going to need until you begin to identify what are the challenges, what's the work to be done, and what kinds of practices will be needed to make progress on that work. And so it's with that frame of mind that I began to distinguish between leaders as a set of, as a sort of a person, and leadership as a practice, as an activity. And nearly all of my work has been devoted, and of many of my colleagues, has been devoted to thinking about the practices of leadership, and then developing teaching methods to strengthen character, skill, ability, to be able to provide and service the kinds of problems that people face in a lot of the kinds of organizational situations that our students meet. Okay, so the first answer to the question, can leadership be taught, is to say leadership has to be taught. But it's not that you can teach all of it. You can't take somebody who has no stomach at all for ambiguity and no, or no stomach at all for conflict and has a very low tolerance for confusion and say this is you know this is leadership is your is your professional mindset because in most settings leadership is going to require the capacity to tolerate ambiguity confusion conflict um, and, uh, and even disorientation, and stay in the game, and not, and not get overly anxious and frightened. But a lot of the people we face are in the middle. They're not at either extreme. They have a mix of talents and capabilities. And if they come to understand what those are, and if they come to understand what's going to be needed to practice leadership, they can complement their strengths with the partnerships they develop. They can make sure that they, like a, you know, in carpentry, if you have a, a weak, a weak uh, timber and you need to strengthen it, it's called sistering it. You screw another strong timber to it so that it's strong. And, and the ways in which we sister ourselves to one another by choosing the right partners to complement our weaknesses becomes a critical way of compensating for the ways in which, you know, in many contexts, the situation requires more capacity to deploy than any one individual can provide. All right, so. I teach people that when they practice leadership, they always need to begin analyzing the situation from the context in, rather than from their, the, their own self out. Rather than starting with their own vision or their own impulse, to start by trying to understand what's the demand of the situation that, that I face. And it may be that my inclinations, my impulses, my own interests, my passion will lead me to work on environmental policy or poverty or human rights or the abuses of women or the politicization of, a, of an authoritarian regime. And that basic sort of sense of possibility is brought to the situation. You bring that sense of possibility, that sense of potential, to the situation. But once you're in the situation, it's not about you exporting your vision. It's, it has to start with you reading the situation. And then beginning to, through very careful listening, diagnostic work, assessment of the situation, begin to discover the relationship between whatever lessons, whatever best practices, whatever ideas you might bring to bear, whatever resources, if you're a World Bank uh, loan officer, 
whatever resources you have to bear, as it can be built from the local culture. So I, I have people start in thinking about leadership from the outside in, from the work to be done, rather than from what they want to project into the world. And this turns out to be a big shift for a lot of my students. Because you don't get to Harvard without being a pretty ambitious person. You know, you want to do a lot of great things, but you also want to be the one doing the great things. <laughs> and we all get scarred up enough, soon enough in professional life, and many of my students are in mid-career, so they've got an accumulation of scars on their back. Pretty quickly, when you start accumulating scars, your initial devoted conviction to the purposes you're trying to achieve, the good you're trying to do, begins to get displaced, and you become the center of analysis rather than the work itself. And that happens in a subtle way, but it happens commonly. It happens frequently. So I, I teach students to begin analyzing leadership, not by starting with themselves, but by starting with their capacity to diagnose the situation. And again, I'm a doctor, so I think about leadership in a pretty simple-minded way. Diagnosis and action. First, you've got to read the situation. What's the problem? What are people up against? What are the resources that those people have to be deployed to work their problem? And then what actions can I take to mobilize those indigenous resources to help people work the problem? And what resources can I bring externally to mesh with their own potential, their own indigenous resources that will help them work their problem and develop their own capacity to work an ongoing stream of problems into the future? So I think like a doctor. And again, even as I just described, I think a little bit more like a psychiatrist than a surgeon. Because in surgery, the mode of operating is you take problems off people's shoulders, you put them to sleep, you fix them up, and after, you know, after a, a couple of months, they get to go back to their lives. Most of the time. Most of the time, surgery works, and it cures you. But in psychiatry, you operate differently. Psychiatry is all about saying, you come to me with a problem, that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. Now how can I help you learn how to solve your problem? Because I can't solve your problem for you. Because your problem actually is in you. And the solution is in you. So my job, and it's a pretty expert job, is how do I create an environment and a set of you know, experiences where you begin to learn how to solve your own problem? That's sort of the mode of operating that I was trained. And, 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 I, and I brought that in thinking about problems here. And I discovered that people in high positions of authority, from you know, heads of an agency, executive directors of a nonprofit, principals of a school, presidents of a country, feel an extraordinary amount of pressure to operate as if they were surgeons and to solve the problem. I come to you desperate with my child, doctor, please heal my child. And it's a blessing when doctors can actually do that. So I teach my students that there are a lot of problems that can be solved through authoritative command and authoritative expertise because they're largely technical. We already have the systems in place. We know how to energize the systems. It takes very sophisticated work to coordinate an emergency room or, or to operate in, in, in surgery. But it's largely technical. Technical in the sense that we're deploying known knowledge and known expertise and known organizational procedures, cultural norms, structures, and processes. We also face, though, and I discovered this first in medicine, but then in, in working here, actually 
also in the Life Extension Institute working with those executives, we also face a lot of problems all over the world in all of our lives that are not purely technical. Problems that require people to change their own ways. Problems that can't be taken off of people's shoulders because they are part of the problem. And therefore, solving the problem requires a more complicated combination of expert, expert solutions, but um, local responsibility. For example, in medicine, you finish surgery and you redo the plumbing to the heart, but the job's only half done. And then, then you give the patient the sermon, as every patient receives around the world. Stop smoking, change your diet, get exercise, and rebalance the stresses of your life. And the compliance rate is really low. I mean, at best, it's 20%. 80% of people, even after going through cardiac surgery, have real difficulty changing the habits of a lifetime. So the work of getting people to own that they are part of the problem, that they are the solution, that the hope lies in them, but the problem also lies in them, is one way to describe the heart or the essence of, of the problem of leadership, the practice of leadership. Because if leadership only meant applying authoritative command in problems, situations that were amenable to expertise, you actually wouldn't need leadership. You would need what, the, what my colleagues at the business school would call management. Or, in my terms, you would only need authoritative expertise. When I ran emergency rooms in hospitals, I didn't need to be practicing leadership. I needed to be doing my job. I was trained. We knew what to do. I just needed to do what I knew how to do. And it was managing a team and coordinating a complex operation, making a lot of crisis decisions, emergency decisions. But it by and large didn't require leadership because it didn't by and large require us to develop new capacity. So I begin in teaching students about leadership that there's a critical diagnostic phase that you've got to read the situation, beginning with the problem. And that as you read the situation, it becomes very important to tease apart the elements of a problem that are technical and amenable to command, and those parts of the problem that are adaptive that require creating new capacity. And I use the term adaptive because coming out of a biological tradition, I think about the challenge of any organism in a changing ecosystem, in a changing environment, in a challenging environment, in a competitive environment, the challenge of that organism developing the capacity to thrive, to thrive in a changing and challenging world. So I like this term adaptation because it gives us all sorts of rich insight as you begin to understand how adaptability happens in nature, it begins to shine a light on what's required to generate adaptability in a, in a human enterprise. So there's a lot to teach people about how to analyze situations. You know, what are the diagnostic indicators? You know, like if, I, if I'm coming up to Roger and he's saying to me, well, you know, I'm, I'm feeling this, you know, I'm having a little difficulty sleeping at night, that's a symptom. I got to collect a lot of data to figure out what's that a symptom of. Well, it turns out that under the pressure to solve problems, many people in authority make some fairly classic mistakes, diagnostic mistakes. Indeed, the most common source of failure that I've seen in leadership from working with lots of people now at the school and uh, in the countryside is, a, is this diagnostic mistake. People treat adaptive challenges as if they were technical problems. 
people would like to imagine that the problem is amenable to authoritative command when it really isn't. And they would like to imagine that not just the person in authority who wants to be the, problem, the chief problem solver, but the people would like to believe that the problem can be solved by looking to some, quote, leader who can solve our problems. And if you can't solve it for us, what did we elect or hire you for? So I begin by teaching people about this distinction, and there's diagnostic indicators. How would you tell the difference? What are the requirements for mobilizing people through an adaptive process where they're building new capacity? What kind of stomach is required? You know, what are the ways in which people are, are prone to avoid some of those tough challenges and engage in patterns of work avoidance? How could you counteract some of those patterns? What are the early warning signs? How can you distinguish productive conflict from unproductive conflict? You know, there are, so there are a whole variety of <coughs> things to teach people that help people read situations and that give people a prolonged patience for staying on the diagnostic side before jumping to solutions. A second common failure in leadership is that people jump to solutions without having gotten the problem right. Obviously in medicine, if you don't get the problem right, your treatment's not going to be the right treatment. But in organizational and political life, people are constantly spending, constantly spending a huge amount of time arguing about solutions rather than debating do we really have a grip on the problem. So by strengthening people's diagnostic capacity, I hope to be strengthening people's patience for keeping people in that diagnostic process before they start jumping to solutions. So there's a great deal to teach people that's analytical about diagnosis. And there's also a lot to teach people in being able to structure and think systematically about action. And I don't have time to, to go over much of that material. And what I'd like to talk a little bit about is teaching me methods. Because that's the next really important part of the, part of the dilemma. But all of that simply to say that if you start from the assumption that leadership is a practice, then there, are a lot, there is a lot to teach about those practices, the assessment practices and the action practices. It turns out that as you teach those practices, you end up also developing people's emotional, developmental, psychological, cognitive capacity. People discover new capacity to think complexly. They develop a, more of a stomach for conflict, <laughs> for commotion, for, for um, chaos, which should enable them to stay in the game longer without jumping to some half-baked or fake remedy simply to restore equilibrium and calm people down. So I find in my classes that people do, in fact, learn a lot of things below the neck and not just above the neck. They learn things that are behavioral and in their impact. They learn things that reshape their own senses of purpose, sometimes that restore them to their senses of purpose. Sometimes for some people, you know, they begin to tap back into their religious tradition because, because of the ways in which they're renewed to their, their sense of purpose. I mean, I don't peddle any religion in my classes, but I'm delighted to see that happen. So I deliberately try to teach people both analytically and emotionally. I don't think you can separate them out very well. Uh, 
Many people in psychology think that you can separate out cognition from affect. I don't really think that's true. So this is how I've tried to develop a way to teach in a way that's transformative in people's capacity. First of all, I think people learn by experience. People learn most powerfully by experience. And the challenge is to design ways to get people to learn from experience. Now, Dean Elwood just described a beautiful set of, of, of innovations in which uh, my colleague Linda Vilmes has been taking students out to the field to learn from experience and then to debrief that experience richly in order to capture lessons from that experience. And I, for 15 years, taught a course that had a lot of field work in it. Marshall Gans, who also teaches experientially, does a lot of field work. But there's also a lot of experiencing that can be done in, in this classroom itself. I've been teaching in this classroom for 30 years. Uh, I hope with the new <laughs> building design they won't wreck this classroom. <laughs> My guess is they will wreck it. They'll take away the intimacy that comes from this 300, this 180 degree design that makes you crowded together where you can, from any chair, you can swivel around and see everybody else. So I begin by saying people learn by experience. And it's, if it's not going to be field work, then let's have it be right here. Or let's have it be having them learn from their past experience. Or let's create some experiences from which they might learn, exercises. So there are several different kinds of experiences that I, that I design. The first is what we call case in point method. And, and, uh, uh, and in this method, we use the classroom itself, the dynamics in this class as a case in point for dynamics that happen in politics and organizational life all the time. So for example, you know, um, I might throw out a question in class and then I might just sit down. And after a few minutes, you know, students will start rustling around, well, wait a second, you know, organize us. And I'll say, okay, well what happens in the absence of authority? What could you learn about the functions of authority? What is there to be learned you know, and the anxiety level goes up. I mean, if I stay quiet for more than 30 seconds, if I stay quiet for five minutes, not infrequently, somebody will emerge to organize the class. They'll come up and they'll say, well, he's not going to do anything. We'll organize it. And they come up and they start writing on the board. And they, at first they get ahead of them steam. They almost always get killed off within <laughs> seven to ten minutes. <laughs> And then we stop the action. We can say, OK, what can we learn from what just happened? And over and over again throughout the whole semester, people are learning from their own present, their own ongoing experience in real time. What just happened now? How come Mary spoke, said something really smart, and nobody paid attention? Ten minutes later, Jack said the same thing, and everybody paid attention. We'd stop the action. What rendered Mary invisible? You know, and then we'll do what's called in medicine a differential diagnosis. It could be a lot of possibilities. Was it gender? Was it the fact that Mary talks a lot and Jack doesn't talk much? That she's burned a lot of credibility up? Is it the timing? Was it her style? You know, it could be a lot of things. You don't want to jump to a conclusion and just say this was a bunch of sexist behavior. But maybe it was. So we step back and we ask, well, what's the data? I mean, the data's right here. You know, what are the clues? What would you listen for? <coughs> of course, that becomes important because nearly everybody in the class has been rendered invisible in some meeting where somebody else walked away with credit. And they struggle to understand, why did that happen to me? And then sometimes they'll go into the next meeting trying to correct for that, but make the wrong move. Because they didn't really understand what they did wrong. 
Maybe what they did wrong was talk too much, so they go into the next meeting talking even more. Or maybe what they did was talk in a particular style, and they continue talking in that style. So I try to teach people at the micro level to be diagnostic and to use the class as a case for learn, learning how to kind of get off the playing field of action, get off the dance floor and up on the balcony, to reflect in the midst of action, to be able to, in the middle of a business meeting, to push your chair back an inch and ask yourself, what's really going on here? You know, I mean, I thought this would go pretty smoothly, but all of a sudden, something's fishy. And to stay diagnostic and ask yourself, what's happening? You know, what issues are percolating beneath the surface? What perspectives are left hidden at this table? Because people are deferring when they really should be speaking. Who, who do I need to tease out <clears throat> in terms of their, their intuition or their idea? So the classroom itself becomes a laboratory to investigate all sorts of very common organizational dynamics. Dynamics of authority between me and the class, which are profoundly challenging for students to learn, and provocative. Provocative because most human beings have a lot of scars on their back from times in which authority has been abusive or untrustworthy, either in their own personal life in their own business career, in their own gendered uh, politics, in their own ethnic relationships, uh, in the political system they've been in. Most people have experienced untrustworthy authorities who've been corrupt or violated uh, trust in one way or another. So when we begin to explore authority relationships in class, it becomes a very provocative set of conversations. And we work those conversations in a way that's quite intimate in, in engaging people and asking, you know, where does their prejudice about authority come from? That level of trust that they operate with, it's very low, rarely naively high. Once in a while, naive, naively high, too deferential. And we work on that because I want to give people the ability to relate with people in authority, seeing authority figures, not as cardboard characters, but as three-dimensional people who are at the node of a network of lots of expectations from below, laterally, from above, across boundaries into other organizations. And then any authority figure is got a lot of strings attached, and they're experiencing a lot of different conflicting and convergent expectations that they've got to juggle. So you can't interpret the behavior of an authority figure just at the individual level. You've got to start from the outside in analyzing the context they're operating in, much of which might be hidden from you. So to understand what the authority's doing, you'd have to do a lot of homework behind the scenes, talking with these people, those people, to try to understand, why is this person operating that way? And usually the, expl the explanation is more in the context than it is in the individual personality. Of course, ultimately it's in both, but it's, it's not 90-10. It's more like 30-70, 40-60 in the context. So we use the classes in case in point to teach about authority relationships. To both teach about the seductions of authority, the traps of charismatic authority, that leadership's not about generating dependency. It's not about just being the go-to person. Leadership's about generating capacity, not just dependency. About leaving people with more capacity than they had when you showed up. And it may be that for a period of a phase of time, they will need to be dependent on you because you are bringing extraordinary gifts. But over time, your job is to not keep them dependent. Your job is to demystify and, and distribute and develop collective capacity. 
So I teach them a lot about authority relationships from both sides of the fence. From the side of, of me as the authority figure being projected into, both vilified and beloved, and to teach them that both are inaccurate, because the idealizations are wrong, are inaccurate, and the vilification is inaccurate. And they begin to discover that over time. And then also to learn what it's like for them when they're the junior, when they're looking up. They may be looking up from a cabinet post, looking up at a prime minister or a, or a, uh, or a president. But, or they may be a president, but they still got a board of directors. Or they may be a dean, but they're still a president. Or they may be the president of the university, but they've got donors to make happy. Some of you folks, there are strings attached. There are expectations to fulfill. So to teach people to have a three-dimensional understanding of authority relationships and, how, and to sort of to, to peel back some of that scar tissue so that they begin to have a more nuanced way of understanding how authority is a virtue and is a value from the family system all the way up to a national system. And yet it also has its limitations. It's a big set of lessons. And it's emotional learning, not just cognitive. And we do it by using the class as a case. And so for four months, the classroom itself becomes sort of a living, a living laboratory. The second major experiential method that we use is to draw on students' own cases. Uh, nearly all of you know from your acquaintance with the Kennedy School that we have a lot of students with rich experience from many, many countries, 90 countries, I think, last year or more. And they bring stories, lots of rich experience. But very few of our courses tap into those experiences. Most case courses present a formally produced case that everybody reads and then discusses. I also use the case method, but all of my cases are cases of the students, cases of their own leadership failure. I ask them to look at failure because they, I want them to develop a very healthy desensitization to failure. I want them to feel that it's really OK to fail, because every single day in leadership you fail. It may be a small tactical failure. I should have talked to Sally before I talked to Louise. Or it might be a larger strategic failure. Boy, that investment was, was a problem, but let me get out before it's too late. In either case, the faster you can admit it to a potential failure, debrief it, capture a lesson from it, the quicker you can go to version 1.1 and version 1.3 and 2.0. So developing in people the capacity to operate in an ongoing learning mode, in an ongoing developmental mode. And the technology sector has given us a wonderful language for this, uh, is itself a big thing to help people learn. And I have them do it by, by working on cases of failure. And a lot of times, you know, not a lot, sometimes, not minority of times, but sometimes students will present a case of success masquerading as a failure. <laughs> you know, because it's just hard to talk about how they fail. But, you know, we, we push them and encourage them and try to make it safe enough for them to examine a failure. And they do it in small groups. Every group stays constant throughout the whole term, and every student gets a chance to present a case of their failure to that group for an hour and a half. And the job of the rest of the group is to provide a consultation. And you know, drawing on the ideas and the readings and the, the conceptual material in the course, how would you apply it to this person's case? And then once a week in the large class, we analyze one of those cases. Just at random, I choose one of the students' cases you know, out, of a, out of a little basket. And, uh, and they come up and they present their case, and then I try to model the analysis of, the, of those cases. I haven't heard the case before, so you know, most of the time they're watching me flounder. 
but I do it out loud so that they can understand my thought process as I grapple with a complex problem case and try to make sense of it, you know, using a few key heuristics as, uh, to generate some new options. The point of all the casework is to generate options. I don't expect anybody to say, this is how we should do it now. But I do want people to come up with new diagnostic options or new action options. Wow, I never thought of that. What I found over the years is that people, by the end of the term, particularly people who come in the mid-career program, who sort of are burned out. <laughs> you know, I mean, they've really got, a lot of people have gotten, that's what those laughters represent. <laughs> you know, and they come here and they kind of want a year to kind of relax, debrief, restore themselves, beginning to discover that there are options that they hadn't seen before. That what felt like victimization was in part their own fault. That maybe there are things they could have done differently that might have changed the odds. That that tends to restore people's, you know, capacity to get back in the game, to take risks again, that they see options. And so that's what I, I really go after, is optionality. And then third, in this sort of pressure cooker crucible of a classroom, I have various structured exercises. Some are film exercises. Some are the small group are themselves an exercise. Students write a case. They, write a, they do an analysis of that small group consultation work every week. It takes them several hours to analyze what happened in that small group, and they learn how to analyze group dynamics. I give them a framework to do that analysis. But then I also have some poetry and musical exercises that draw out of that other part of my background. We have three three-hour evenings where I have people bring a poem and uh, where people volunteer and someone will come up in here and with a microphone, they'll read the poem, and I'll coach them on how to read in order to illustrate about five or six key lessons in leadership practice that are hard to talk about in other ways, and the music really helps. So we talk about what it means to be in a creative mode where you're improvising in leadership, where you don't know where you're going. You don't know how it's going to turn out. But you've got to provide the holding environment. You've got to provide the rock of stability to prevent people from panicking, because you're the one in front, because you're the one in authority. And that capacity to hold steady, provide a holding environment, provide the sort of part of the walls of the containing vessel to buffer anxiety, even when you're anxious, is a pretty critical skill. So that's the one, one of the things we illustrate in that exercise. And then we illustrate that leadership is an improvisational art. Because after they, I work with a poem, I have them make up a song without any words, just ah, and they make up a song. And that's for many people, worse than embarrassing. It's worse than outward bound. It's a completely mortifying experience. But leadership is, is, is a courageous enterprise. And, uh, and it's a big experience when people come up here and they, and they move through their poem and then they improvise a song. So they learn about improvisation. And then the audience learns about listening. They learn how to listen musically and not just analytically. To listen to the song beneath the words. What's in the nonverbals? What are people really saying that they can't put in words? How to listen for that level, because that's where the values lie. When people talk, they don't often put the values in the words, but the values is carried in their tone of voice, in the urgency, in the anxiety, in the passion. 
in the depression, in the despair, in the, in the level of energy they have to go into the fray again. And, and listening then to the song beneath the words is a really important source of data along with listening analytically. And so the audience learns to listen musically. And, and, and the, these exercises illustrate that. And they also illustrate inspiration. Inspiration is a pretty important tool in leadership. It's also a danger. A lot of people become charismatic authorities. They don't exercise any leadership. They inspire the hell out of people right, into, right over a cliff, right into disaster. But inspiration is also an enormously powerful tool if you can inspire people to make the extra effort, to go the extra mile, to take, take the additional risk, to suffer through the transitional pain. Uh, then it's a very useful tool, a very useful resource. And the musical exercises help me analyze for people where inspiration comes from. How can you inspire people simply by the way you allow yourself to be moved in moving other people? So all of these exercises create an experiential laboratory to teach leadership. Over the years, you know, uh, the um, we win awards a lot. Uh, the, the alumni a few years ago started to vote for most influential course. And five years after leaving the school, they started having a vote, you know, for the most influential course in retrospect. And this course that I just described has won the award six out of six years. <laughs> After the first couple of years, I think it was a little embarrassing to the school, so now it's, they give it to three people at the same time. <laughs> but I'm quite proud of what we all accomplish in this laboratory because the students put a lot of heart and soul and blood and sweat um, as they courageously seek to understand their own cases, what happened to them and suffer through those cases and suffer with one another. And in doing so, I think they begin to learn stuff that stays with them over the years. OK, so that's a good piece of it. There's, <laughs> there's another piece, which is the intensive January course, which is Leaders from the Inside Out. But I don't have time for that. But let me give you a few minutes for questions. I'm, Sorry for doing a Fidel Castro on you and speaking for all of the time. But, uh, I'm glad to open up for discussion. Yes. I think that there are both um, retail and wholesale answers to the question, <laughs> if I could use that metaphor. On the, on the, on the retail side, you know, um, I'm 63, and I started doing this when I was 32. And uh, Dean Williams did a great job of teaching the same course I teach for 14 years. The school didn't promote him. That was a real problem in our promotions process. The dean has now formed a committee to rethink our promotions process. It's provoked by that, I think, by that event. So in the short term, we've jerry-rigged being able to staff these courses. But these courses are a little frightening to the rest of my, to many of my colleagues at the school. And, 
And because of that, um, there's been a, there has not been as much a desire to build from them in application to other, other curricular areas um, and, and other leadership contexts, as I would hope. So on the retail side, I think there's a real need to help the school invest in uh, hiring faculty uh, who would be devoted to learning how to teach these materials and to teach in these experiential methods. Um, and on the wholesale side, I think we need to figure out um, how to teach other people around the world how to develop leadership pipelines for their own organizations and societies. And there already are many, many efforts out there of alumni who are teaching in many different places, from Bangladesh to Lima and, and, uh, and, and Bogota and, and uh, Buenos Aires and lots of different places. Um, but it's not organized. And, and I think we, we need to put our mind to, through the help of volunteers, through the help of funding, to create the, the, the systems in place to um, uh, to make available to people what we've learned in these 30 years of experimenting uh, so that other people can take it to new places. I mean, this is a very big frontier. It's like the, the coast of Maine. You know, it's a very craggy frontier. It's, it's not a linear coastline. So there are lots of places, like how, how would you practice leadership in healthcare policy in this particular community as the, in Louisiana, versus Des Moines, versus you know, the country of, or the state of um, the Valle de Cauca in Colombia. I mean, each different context requires people to prepare to read that context and figure out how to practice leadership into that context. So there's a lot that we could be doing as a school to be um, developing courses on leadership in this policy context, leadership in this uh, institutional context, leadership in the developmental, in the development context. And some of that has, has begun to come online. Uh, in the development world uh, area, Matt Andrews has been doing wonderful work that kind of builds on a related set of ideas to get people to start with the problem indigenously rather than starting the problem from a, you know, let's, ex let's, let's export best practices point of view. And I think that's really important. So uh, I think that there's a lot that both that alumni and that, uh, and that the donor community could do to, um, to root the kind of work we've been doing and, and have it built from more broadly in the school as well as, uh, as, well as in the larger world. Yes? Uh, well, actually, uh, last summer I went to Stephanie and I had a six month career with UNICEF. And in fact, from an education perspective, uh, a lot of teaching leadership is well, right now in what's needed actually in formal education. And there's a, a crisis in education right now, right, with the uh, dynamic changes, the fact that we have all this internet and content is open and Facebook. So the, the question is, how exactly, how can you build a relationship, for example, with the Harvard School of Education on the future of learning to actually explore not only leadership education, but just education in general, because critical thinking and skills that you've talked about here are exactly the type of skills, competencies, and knowledge that all kids need but to survive. Going back to your point about adaptive leadership, adaptation is now, we're at a point on the earth where adaptation is, is about survival. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea that this education, this leadership education is actually what we need in all education. And so there, there may be some scope to, to, to work with the Future of Learning project. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. I'd love to do that. I have close friends in college with the School of Education, um, but, uh, um,
So anyway, <laughs> if you want to make that happen, I'd be happy to collaborate. <laughs> When, I, when I, I spent 17 years setting the groundwork for starting the Center for Public Leadership and then, uh, and then uh, persuaded the dean to, to support it and then, and then went and spoke to Les and Abigail Wexner you know, to fund it and they were wonderful collaborators in, in starting the center. Um, but the center has kind of gone off in a different direction. So it's not doing leadership education or even leadership research in, in the way that, that would build from this body of work. I would like to see that happen, but, but the in, investments in the center are, are by and large being deployed in other ways. Um, I think uh, the, the university, the school has a tendency to get anxious about its academic respectability. So sometimes the work, which is to prepare people for leadership that's going to improve the world, gets displaced for main, maintaining academic respectability. Um, and uh, so I, I hope that in, in, in this new wave of, uh, of uh, contributions to the, to the Center for Public Leadership, that will also provide us with, a, um, with uh, some resources to do both this retail piece of work of keeping um, this kind of teaching happening and expanding it at the Kennedy School, as well as uh, finding ways to um, share it with the rest of the world more broadly than we have informally. And the Ed School would be great partners. Yes? My name is Claire. I did this class in 2004. Um, I said it's going to change my life. I'm so mad about my abroad. I'm sorry, could you speak up just a little bit louder? Yes. You've been doing this for 32 years. At 28, you've been talking to these executives Get this and works. commissioners. Uh, can you see that better than I can? What would you go back? Okay, so I said, my name's Claire. I did this class in 2004. They said it would change my life, and it did. I met my husband, and uh, we got married. Yeah. <laughs> and it changed my life. So my question was, you're 63, you've been doing this for 32 years, and you said when, uh, when you were 28, rush me. <laughs> you were talking to these executives and prisoners, what now, if you could go back, what would you sort of tell them? What do you know now that you would tell them <coughs> about their adaptive challenges? Um. I, I, I think I would have things to tell the business executives, but I don't know that I'd have much to tell. I mean, in the, in the 10 minutes that I had with the inmates, the prisoners, they have come in from a local jail. In that 10 minutes in the middle of the night, I, I'm not sure that there'd be anything more that I could do but to, you know, just try to treat them with some respect. But I don't think there's anything that I could have done. These, this was a sociological problem. Everybody coming into the prison had been poor and beat up, and nearly everybody was black or Hispanic. There weren't any firstborn sons from Scarsdale or Great Neck <laughs> coming into the Rikers Island prison during the night. And, and, and so, you know, I, I wouldn't, however, however much pride I have in what I've been able to do, I'm not so grandiose to think that I'd know what to say to those guys in the middle of the night. And even with the executives in an hour, hour and a half, you know, you can say a few things that might get them thinking. You might re refer them to a few things, people to go talk to, but um, and and things to read. Uh, but but you don't turn the lights on in an hour. I mean, you can turn the lights on momentarily, but the person goes home and lights go off again. You know, I'm pretty sober, pretty sober about what you can accomplish with people in a short time and what it takes to stay in the game with people and accomplishing changes and you know and, and I think trying to do it in four months is already an enormously ambitious enterprise. When I fly into various uh, countries or companies and do two or three day workshops or longitudinal workshops over time, 
you know, we, we have to have much more focused objectives to be able to accomplish something in a, you know, within a, a, a shorter framework. So that's more than you asked for, but yes. You know, when you, when you say that, what's your piece of the mess? Can you say it? What's your piece of the mess? Where's your DNA on this? Where are your fingerprints on this? It's so scary, to be honest, about those failures. Um, and I just want to thank you. It was, it's, a push, it's a push I needed. I think it's probably one many of us struggle with. You're trying to feel like you want to give a testimonial. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people... A lot of people really are innocent victims. But if you can find fingerprints on the situation, it, it, it's really empowering to discover them because there's not a lot of power in innocent victimization. One has to nurse those wounds and restore oneself to health in other ways. Um, yes? Hi, I'm also a type year uh, witness here. <coughs> And yes, I agree that your course was by far the one that made the most difference. Um, so, so like building on a little bit of the questions that Vanessa and the others have asked, um, yes, it doesn't, it's hard to, to turn the light on in an hour. It's hard enough in four months. So how can we extrapolate? Like I feel um, I would gain so much from having a continuous or some kind of feedback loop five years down that we could uh, either reconnect or maybe have like follow-up work yes. in somewhat of a structured way. Yes. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are yes. on that. Yes. I think it's really important for us to develop a, an, an alumni support system for people, for both cohorts. The people who are trying to practice leadership in contexts all over the world and people who are trying to teach or consult or train in leadership, which is a smaller cohort. But there is a cohort of graduates uh, for, for whom that's what they would love to do, is, 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 is teach and, and develop leadership pipelines in some sector or some um, uh, community or country. Uh, so I think for both those cohorts, it would be really great to develop a support system with materials, with peer you know, uh, support systems like uh, one of the successful organizations in the world is called the Young Presidents Organization. And the most successful product, it's an organization of presidents of companies who become president by the time they're 40 of a certain size. And they have a very robust network around the world. There's I know, more than 15,000 members or somewhere in that ballpark. And they have all sorts of programs. They have a week at the Harvard Business School. They have regional meetings, they have an annual big international meeting, they invite people like me to speak at it, and, but the most successful, the most successful thing they do, of all the things they do, is called the forum. And the forum is simply where, you know, um, uh, seven to twelve people in a community get together once a month, like on a Sunday evening from four to eight in the evening, and uh, and they'll talk. And they'll talk about their professional lives, they'll talk about their personal lives, and the interface, and, uh, and according to YPO members, that's, that's not only the most successful, but it, they, those groups stay stable for many years. So I, I'm thinking, you know, in a, in a sense, on the wholesale side of Vanessa's question, what would be a support system for people over the years it would be great to create a system where people could even discover. Because a lot of people don't even know that in their same community. Or with the technology these days, you could have those kinds of meetings even if you don't have anybody locally, but you could use technology to have those kinds of. But I think the ongoing case debriefing of real life experience, you know, and having a group of people with them to do that is essential to keeping uh, the learning alive and, and, and to keep learning from your own practice and 
and not burn out. So um, I'm very eager to do that, and I, I would love to see help in doing that, volunteer help, financial help in building a, an alumni network. 30 years ago, I persuaded the, the alumni network to, uh, office to start having a refresher once a year. So now we do that once a year. Uh, Pete Zimmerman was also instrumental in that, former executive uh, dean, executive program dean. Um, uh, but there's not much else that happens. And at least for my alumni who are focused on leadership practice, I, I would very much like to see, see that happen. And that's something I'm actively pursuing now. And uh, a piece of funding would help a lot right now because there's a woman I'd like to hire as executive director. And, you know, if I had the money to hire her, we've already got the database, we'd get started. So, uh, just yes? One interesting model is, well, I'm Director Kennedy. Um, I'm here for our Young Global Leader uh, reunion. Yes. Uh, and so one interesting model is, is our program here. Yes. Uh, and I'm a Young Global Leader for the World Economic Forum. Uh, and we are we have convened here because they have created a, a special executive education program over the last number of years for us, and it's a nice cross pollinization with the Kennedy School, the Business School. We have even the medical schools, and, yes. uh, and and so my question, well, one, my comment is that that might be an interesting model of how we've been doing things yes. and our reunion that's happening yes. you know, now and that kind of thing. And we have monthly gatherings around the world in various cities. Yes. And so we have a very deep right. network. Yes, uh, and fantastic. that was the whole purpose of Professor Schwab creating right. the Young Global Leader right. Group. Uh, and my question is... It's a very expensive model. It's a very expensive <laughs> model, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think there are ways to do that even at low cost, lower cost, to capture certain key elements. What would be useful to know from you is if you had a much more limited budget than the World Economic Forum has, which of those pieces do you think would be most essential I, well, I think to it's, preserve? It's part of it's the, my question is the, um, what was very, is very special is, is the cross-pollinization. So how much of that um, happens with your work, which is so interesting, and for example, uh, Bill George's work on leadership and other you know, work like that within the university system because that's what they offered us is that the different views. Right, 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 right. I, I, um, I, I was quite disappointed in the design of that program. I'm not probably the best person to ask. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because I think they could have done something much more powerful in two weeks with you than the smorgasbord that they gave you. We might have to get you in the next round. Well, that would be a political problem. Okay. <laughs> I don't touch that. But anyway, uh, maybe I'll see you at the in Davos next year. Yes. Just want it's a very low cost um, model that we've been doing here in the Boston area with alumni. Um, it started after actually one of your video conference series. And it's, it's just a group of alumni to get together, and either we bring in speakers or we do case studies. And I just buy the bagels and send out the emails. But we've been doing it for over ten years, and it certainly is replicable. Which can be speaking in Boston. Boston. That's wonderful. That's so great. I didn't even know you were doing that. We kept it under the radar and totally self-directed. And one more question, then we really got to stop. We're over time. Go ahead. How much money do you need by the time of management? I would say to hire a full-time executive director of probably $100,000 for the first year, maybe $150 so to hire staff and and convene a, an uh, international meeting next May, which would be our goal, uh, and then to refine the database and, and then to make it self-generating. The goal would be to make it self-generating. So, so you need at least 100 to 150 for at least the executive director role, but then for, for yeah, just for the first year, but you wouldn't, you'd also need support staff right. for that. Yeah, I would imagine, no, I'm not very good at this stuff. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've started two we'll organizations and, not, and, not, and, and lost control of both of them very quickly, so <laughs> <laughs> this is not something I'm good at. Okay. I was just trying but, to But maybe that. some good no, organizations, no, no. but, but. There's less than a minute. That's nice to know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.